Hello and welcome to this Blackwell Online podcast. My name is George Miller, and my guest today is Mary Rubin, whose Mother of God presents a fascinating and rich history of the Virgin Mary, which has been praised by Hilary Mantel as elegant, mysterious, and touching, and by Stephen Greenblatt as an intellectually exuberant tour de force. The book charts the ways in which the meaning of Mary was constructed and directed, how her image developed and grew in worship, art, music, writing and popular culture. Its great achievement, it seems to me, is to provide the reader with a wealth of detail while never losing sight of the big picture. It's now over thirty years since Marina Warner published her landmark study of the Virgin Mary, Alone of All Her Sex. I began by asking Mary if she had undertaken her book with a sense that new perspectives had opened up which she wanted to explore since the Warner book appeared. I didn't really begin the book as, as um, what can I do 30 years after Marina Warner or indeed 20 years as when I started. It, it was more a question of how I found myself as a medieval historian looking at medieval culture and finding that uh, Mary was just sort of taken to be just there as just part of things absolutely naturally and not really problematized. I mean, you know, a sort of figure so ubiquitous and so important and uh, just absolutely glad there, sort of waiting to be explored. I mean, as opposed to, I mean, obviously, Marina Warner's book is just so important and so much love. You know, it's never been out of print. It's a fantastic study. And it also arises from her own sensibility as a feminist, from a Catholic background, Catholic education, engaging in the 70s with all the possibilities of critique within her tradition. I approach it very differently. Oh, I suppose from my own tradition, as much as I was very interested in sort of, I'm always very interested in Jewish Christian relations, and I found that very often when Mary pops up in medieval culture, it is uh, not just as, you know, obviously a sort of consoling and merciful figure, uh, but also one who defines difference and defines opposition and defines the sort of the boundaries of Christianity and indeed leads people to go beyond them with, through, through, through mission and through, um, and through conquest, if we, if we think of the reconquest of, of Iberia, or if we think of the definition of heretics, or who's in and who's out, and indeed in relations between Jews and Christians, a lot of the debates were over issues that were put Mary to the fore, the incarnation, the virgin birth, the whole notion of associating godliness with the body, which of course is the great new big idea of Christianity. Mm. So uh, Mary turned up in areas that uh, are normally meant to be her domain or indeed explored or, or or problematized by historians. So then I thought, actually, there isn't a single study by someone who is, you know, immersed in medieval early modern culture and who perhaps also has the skills to go back a little bit in time, even earlier. So it really starts at the beginning. And I come from Jerusalem myself. I know, I know a lot of the places. I know a lot of the sort of situations, the emergent Christianity. So I felt, you know, although it was extending beyond my normal area of expertise, I could do it with some responsibility and some effect. So really what, what started as sort of a thought about Mary in the Middle Ages, I sort of felt it's too big a phenomenon to, to just do a comfortable little study in my area of where I normally dwell. I really had to go beyond both before and of course after as well and to say and, and how does Mary become a global figure. So if you see, so, so although Marina Warner was always part of the world out there and a really important point of reference and also so beautifully written, there's also a way in which the motivations intellectual and other were also came from very many other places. When you do go back to the very earliest traces of Mary, you discover that the sources are, are very few and you the, the way you sort of express what the earliest Christians were trying to do is, is by using the very modern concept of a backstory. Now, can you say a little bit about in the ways in which that backstory was being mobilized? Yes, I mean, definitely, cause, because it's really important to imagine ourselves back into that world where the Gospels are only one way for Christians to think about their identity or the followers of, of Jesus, let's call them, even the word Christianity doesn't exist until much later, and they emerge as a story, the powerful story about, you know, the charismatic leader, the new idea, uh, and his followers, and the acts which he left, and the memories of him. So uh, Mary is part of that story at crucial moments, like 
Christ's obvious birth of Christ and, and his very early life, but really not much more afterwards. On the other hand, what is also obvious is that there are other registers, other types of sources that are being produced, other types of conversations that are taking place and producing narrative traces, which are about people asking, uh, so, you know, what does it mean, you know, to be born of a woman? What sort of woman would that be? So that by the early second century, you know, we have uh, a gospel little sort of gospel, well, a text like a gospel in a way, a biography, a holy biography of Mary that answers all those questions. And one can imagine that what we happen to have remaining in one particular second century papyrus is part of a greater world that has sort of disappeared in a way of the conversations that preceded in a way um, uh, persuasion and perhaps conversion in these mm. conversations between Jews and Jewish Christians, between Jews and enthusiasts about Christ, between Gentiles and enthusiasts of Christ and so on. Mm. And there, obviously, one of the questions that would arise is, you know, the mass of innovation is indeed a God-made flesh. So what is the nature of that flesh? Where does it come from in the whole issue of a sort of human lineage? And that is how I think Mary is discussed. I mean, how can you turn a woman into a vessel, into a person worthy, you know, fitting mm. to, uh, to bear a God indeed? So in a way, the making of Mary, the, the creation of a background, how she was born, how she was bred, how she was kept pure in her life is as important to the work of persuasion as was what was happening in parallel, of course, that is the development of a strong notion of Christ as mm. both man and God, which is really, really difficult as well. And it's really in the fourth century then, once Christianity, you know, comes out into the open, is endorsed by a massive, massive sort of imperial machine of government and, and, and art and, and in a sort of bureaucratic support in a way, that there are really authoritative pronouncements. And whenever you have a pronouncement about Jesus, you obviously also have the pronouncement about his mother. I'm thinking of the creed, of course, the various creedal mm. formulations. I mean, I'm not, you know, obviously much more time is spent on the nature of Christ, but, uh, but she is absolutely always there as part of a story, which means that there is always some place and some f official attention to Mary. But I would also suggest that there was a lot of unofficial interest as well that is happening for other reasons, for the very great fascination of a figure of a mother of God and the ways in which such a figure also can interact with and be enriched by pre-existing notions of um, you know, feminine sanctity, mm. uh, sacrality, power, like say in Egypt, the figure of Isis. And of course, in the uh, pagan world, the, the many traditions of, um, of powerful women and goddesses.